Hey guys, welcome to Coaching with Chris. I'm super excited. We got Scott Rose today. We're gonna learn about appraisals. Look, there's one thing about uh, our businesses is that appraisals and how they affect our market, what's it gonna look like going forward, uh, this whole AI discussion. And I'm excited to be able to really truly dive in to the whole appraisal uh, and uh, and learn and understand from Scott. But look, if you haven't signed up for my boot camp, I got a few seats left. I know it's next week. I know it's last minute, but I know a lot of you are last minute. And so, hey, if you want to get to this boot camp, I think it's the best boot camp I've ever put together. Mindset, prospecting, great tactics, working on your team, being able to overcome this market and then take advantage of what the next three years are going to bring. This is the boot camp for you. So if you haven't signed up, please, please, please. I want to change your life and I can't do it unless you come here. So Scott, come on in here. Uh, I can't wait to uh, really be able to dive into uh, appraisals. And uh, I, I, my first question, Scott, is thank you for coming on. But two is, is that, uh, how did you get into this game? Oh man, that goes back a, a ways, uh, Chris, but I actually got in to the appraisal profession working summers in an appraisal office back in 1995. Back before we had digital cameras and everything else, I would run the back Polaroids? to the one. You yes, right. The Polaroids on there. Or the, the, remember one hour Photoshops? Um, yeah. We would, I would run back and forth from the one hour Photoshop and glue all the photos into three cop paper copies of the appraisal and, uh, deliver those to our to our customers, which ultimately led me to getting my appraisal license uh, in 2000. And um, you know, I, I used it to put myself through college at, at, at CU and studied computer science and applied math. And then down the road, those two things kind of merged. And I'll save you the the, the long story there, but that's kind of how I got in the game. You know, I know classes uh, uh, in my mind want, considered to be one of the premier uh, companies. How long have you been with class? A little over five years now, and I pre appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. I'd like to think of us the same way. Uh, I don't know what I think about John, but yeah, <laughs> we'll save that for a conversation. That, is that another topic? Yeah. yeah. What yeah. about John? <laughs> exactly. Uh, <laughs> well, um, you know, I got I got a lot of questions, but um, you know, I think the biggest question is is where are we headed and what, what is it going to look like uh, in a year, two years, and five years out? So I think, um, in short, where we're heading is going to have, moving into a full spectrum of products and options around collateral valuation. I don't know that we'll always be a traditional 1004 or you know 1073 for a condo type of environment on every single mortgage transaction that goes through. I think we're going to start to see some options based off certain risk criteria, property type, et cetera, that investors look at and determine what do they really need to know about that property. And so I think what's exciting is, you know, all of us have been through a few cycles at this point, whether it was 2016 or 2020 and 2021, where we had a, a pretty strong um, strain on appraiser capacity and prices went up, t t turn times went out, you know, extremely far. And so now we'll have more options to, to help reduce that. And that would be things like waivers that were all accustomed to, right? We, we've all used to using waivers. Well, now there's, you know, both Fannie and Freddie have added options that are a waiver plus data collection. And so it doesn't necessarily need a full appraisal. It comes with value acceptance uh, up front, but they want to understand and ensure the property is in okay condition and meets their eligibility standards. Maybe that property was uh, eligible for a waiver, but was in an area where there was a, a recent natural disaster. They just want to make sure everything's still standing and, and there and, and okay. Um, and there's some other aspects that go into it as well, but there's a whole nother sliver now in there where it's a waiver plus data. Mm -hmm. And then we also have in the next level of spectrum is using that data and information to provide to an appraiser to do a desktop appraisal or a hybrid appraisal where maybe they don't have to visit the property. And the way property data is being collected is going to look a lot different. It already does look a lot different. We can now send five different people out to a property using technology that will give you the same five results every single time. It wow. generates a digital twin of the home. It has a lot more comprehensive information. So it really allows for full transparency in the process and more confidence that all the data is being collected accurately and consistently. More source of truth data around property. 
And and last, I would say, we're going to start to see these worlds come, you know, merge and come together more. So maybe instead of sending an appraiser out post transaction uh, to gather the data and information on a purchase, maybe that data and information is being captured at point of list with tools that can also enhance the marketability of the property, like 3D tours and high quality imagery. But then at the same time, all the data is collected that's needed to support these downstream processes that we were just talking about, which I yeah. think is the ideal. I mean, th this world has really become data driven. Wouldn't you agree? I would. The one question that always just baffles me and hey, look, I I'm a lender. I like to do as many loans as I can. Um, I don't obviously want buybacks and to be able to participate in in anything uh, that hap just generally happens. But I don't want to make that percentage larger. You know, how do you think we're going to solve Fannie Freddie collecting all of this data um, over these last years? But property condition uh, is something that technology and data can't solve. Well, I don't know that it can't solve. It can add and add support. And, you know, honestly, when you talk about buybacks, one of the top reasons for a repurchase is, is uh, physical characteristics of the property being misrepresented. And so if it's not captured right or, or something's not um, addressed in the in the appraisal underwriting process around property characteristics, that's usually one of the things that can cause, I think it's number two or number three reasons for, for repurchase demands. Yep. When we use technology to capture that information, it's now more comprehensive, more consistent, more standard, um, and more source of truth. It actually can protect the lender from repurchase risk downstream. There's also a lot more information for the lender to leverage and say, no, look, here, I have a complete digital twin. Everything was captured at the property. This is a condition it was in at that current state. And, you know, as we speak, image recognition technologies are advancing every single day. And they're actually getting pretty good at identifying condition and quality of, of property. I mean, there's image recognition technology out there that can tell you from photos of a kitchen if it was recently updated, if those uh upgrades came from home depot or lowe's or was it custom right so um it's continuing to advance these are the same tools that get used to drive self-propelled vehicles that we're using to collect property data and they're going to continue <laughs> to advance um as as time goes on and and we'll get more accurate and more consistent um than where we were previously and you know, I kind of thought we talked earlier, right? I used to drive one and back and forth to the one hour Photoshop, but we don't see one hour Photoshops anymore. Everything is digital and that digital camera transformed the appraisal industry. And now we're at a point where there's a lot of technologies available out there that can really assist in bringing more credibility to the process. So are you saying you're going to send a drone to my house? No, <laughs> maybe one day. The cool thing is, the imagery can be captured really from any perspective. It could be on a tripod with an iPhone. Um, it can be a human holding the camera. And uh, I suppose, you know, I guess conceptually, it could be a drone flying through the house. I don't know how, how soon we'll be there. Um, but maybe a robot car will drive to the property and a drone will fly off that car and go in and scan the house and go away. And there'll be no humans. But I think we're quite a ways away from stuff like that. You know, this reminds me a lot of the cartoon I used to watch when I was a kid, the Jetsons. The Jetsons, man. Yeah, right. absolutely. Okay. Uh, some of you probably don't even know that what the Jetsons are. You'll have to YouTube it. But uh, um, so, you know, picking a company like yours um, and, you know, walking through the true value uh, my big word that we're working on as a company is impact. Um, what what does your company do different, better? Um, I know you're biased, but then all of the others. Well, I, I, impact is a great word. Um, I think we think of creating value for our partners and, and their partners, right? So, you know, you, you have a partner or, or a consumer that you're working with, a customer. And the experience they have working with us is important to you, just as important it is for your experience working with us. And so we constantly are trying to figure out and, and focus on ways we can continue to deliver a better experience to our partners. And one way we do that is by trying to be, you know, on the leading edge of technology and the direction things are going and making sure our partners know the opportunities and the options that are out there for them. For instance, 
you know, John Fraz, our CEO, always talks about these waiver and data programs is essentially the next best thing to a waiver. We know that you love waivers, right? Because you get a waiver, you're done. You don't have to worry about anything. You're, you're, you're not worried about an appraisal coming in and impacting the outcome. You're not worried about timing. You're not worried about chasing anything down. It's done. Um, well, with a waiver plus data, so value acceptance plus data with Fannie Mae or ACE plus PDR with Freddie Mac, both of those are essentially a waiver with, with data. It's a more cost-effective product and it's a fast product. And so with a matter of a day or two, you're getting the results back and, and you can move forward with your transaction at a lower cost. Um, and it provides more certainty up front. And then as well as, as we're leveraging Go back though, Scott, just sure, so that sure. we cover that for everyone. Um, what is the cost difference? So typically around $250 for a data and waiver program compared to the cost of your traditional tenant floor. Okay, okay, got yeah. it. Sorry and then you, when I just want to make sure no you're fine that. you know it, it's um it, and then the downstream process this is essentially everything is done for the same cost so all the innovation that we've added to the process is is purely driving improved outcomes and not driving up cost and potentially over time we could see it actually reduce costs um but right now it, it's allowing us within the cost of what a traditional appraisal costs today to layer in all these benefits, which what we see when we look at desktop appraisal or hybrid appraisal using these technologies is improved KPIs across the board. So we do have less uh, requests for uh, fee increases in, in those programs. We have uh, improved turn times. We have reduced underwriting revisions. We have reduced requests for reconsiderations from consumers or real estate agents and others. Um, and so it really drives a, an improved outcome throughout the whole process when we standardize that upfront data capture. Um, you know, a lot of times appraisals come back for wrong photos, missing photos, blurred photos, sketches that are mislabeled. Um, you know, these are common things that come up uh, back and forth in the process. Well, those are all eliminated when you use this technology. So it just drives efficiencies in the whole uh, cycle. And, and improved outcomes. And like I said, also uh, in terms of repurchase and things of that nature, it's going to further help to support that and protect the lender from that perspective. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how, how do you be selective in making sure you have the best appraisers for these markets across the country? Like, you know, um, I, I one time, uh, the scariest story I've ever had was we sent an appraiser out to do an appraisal. This is probably early 2000s. And um, uh, he went through and he was doing the inspection inside and the mother came around the corner and he had picked the baby up out of the crib. Oh um, yeah, like it was, it was awful. Not only did it ruin the experience for us as a company uh, because we had ordered the appraisal, but uh, it, it just all around was very hard to even explain, like, why would you do something so dumb um, yeah. and, and uh, mistrusting and every other word that you could think of. But like, how do, how do you screen your appraisers? And then more importantly, I think um, if, if I'm a mortgage broker, you know, I want to make sure that I've got the best of the best going out there to... Um, support that value in still a low inventory environment yeah those are great questions and, and uh so a couple of things one is you know first of all we measure everything in our organization we're extremely data driven and so every component of the appraisal process from customer experience um to quality and delivery on time rates um you know overall turn times are are measured and we t we take that data and information and we, we keep it in our, in our data warehouse. <clears throat> and we have a whole data science team that actually works with that information. And so about almost 55% you know, to 60% of our orders are assigned to, through our Smart Assign um, platform, which is data science driven, computer driven um, assignment algorithms. So the computer, and this is something we've actually been working on this for, for years, and we always measure it against the, the human outcome in terms of what we experienced we had previously, but we're essentially using predictive analytics to know exactly how that order is gonna go based on which appraiser that we assign it to. And so we leverage all that historic, and you know, we've done over 2 million appraisals at, at class. And, and so we have all this information to leverage transactionally to learn and understand more how our appraisers perform 
and in order to get the right or, you know, get the order in the right hands. And so that's been, uh, you know, kind of a mantra we've worked off of for years, which is always getting the orders in the, in the right hands. And again, it's that experience, right? One appraisal bad experience can, can reflect so poorly. Um, you know, you can lose business over a yeah. thousand good transactions. It just takes one transaction before, you know, we tend to see people, um, you know, get frustrated and, and look for other options. And so it's, it's quite a highly um, uh, intense environment in the AMC world, right? To, to execute um, on, a, on a regular basis. You know, one of the big feedbacks that I always get is, uh, and, you know, it would be awesome to be able to explain is, is that, you know, you as a company, how do you hold uh, an appraiser accountable? Uh, and two is, how do you do that through your extreme follow-up? So I think on the on the accountability side, you know, we have a whole team of appraisers inside a class that in our escalations group, um, you know, we want to make sure that when we're getting into those escalations, as it relates to the appraisal, at least and the appraisal component of this process, that we have the right people, the educated people that are in the right seats to, to work through those those issues. And we have a. Um, uh, you know, an appraiser escalation group, the, a risk committee that can go through and determine if appraisers need to be removed from the panel if, if things are egregious enough to, to do so. And there's a whole process to do that that has to meet all the regulatory guidelines because we do, we're highly regulated, right? We're licensed in 50 states. There's federal regulations. We have client regulations or, you know, clients that are regulated and we have to ensure that we're we're operating to those expectations as well. So it's a, it's a very formal process. Um, but one that I think we have pretty greased at class. And again, you know, you get really good at it when you do the number of transactions we, we do. Um, and so over time, you, you also whittle down to the key partners that you work with on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, we have thousands of appraisers that we work with that have earned, um, you know, th themselves onto our class act panel. And those are the ones that we go to also um, out of the gate because they've got a proven track record and they've been working with class for a long time. Ah, so so an appraiser that's worked for you a good time, had good results, had great feedback, um, and you really truly knew the quality of work is probably going to get more appraisals than maybe for some sure. rookie that joined. Yeah, absolutely. It takes a little while to work your way, work your way into that rotation. You know, it's it's definitely an, an earned, um, you know, it's an earned value that they that they get by working with class over time and showing us that they're a good partner. You know, and those partnerships are just as important to us from an experience perspective, too, because you want to keep those good appraisers on your panel and you want to provide them with an experience as well. That's that's positive so that they they want to continue working with you. And we do. We've established some great relationships. Uh, oftentimes the, the media and, you know, there's a loud few of, of appraisers out there that often, you know, give AMCs a bad name. But I'll tell you, we have a lot of appraisers that really love to work with class and we've built long term relationships with and, and it's uh, it's mutual uh, value add for, for each of us. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. You know, one of the big topics in um, South Dakota, and I'm, I know that I'm just a really small state, but. Cool state, it, though. Get some great stuff great. there. Yeah, yeah. Is, is bringing up the youth uh, in appraisers is hard. And the university here uh, is working really hard to be able to create a degree in becoming an appraiser. And, you know, we really support that, especially for our industry of to be able to bring up the youth. I mean, if I want to be a doctor, uh, you know, I, I mean, I go through college, I get my degree and, 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 uh, you know, I come out and, go through my internship and, and, and voila, I'm going to, you know, go get my position to be a doctor, but actually to be an appraiser, um, it, it quite possibly could be harder, uh, because you got to have an appraiser to be able to put you under as a mentor. And really, truly the way the rules are written today is, is that they feel like, well, I'm just hiring my competition. And, and I know that this is not really in, uh, in class, right? But you're dealing with uh, thousands of appraisers. You're, you're heavily involved into uh, this business. What's your perspective? Has that changed? Is it getting better? And and how do we bring the youth in? And is appraisers uh, five, 10 years actually um, appraisal license actually going to still be or exist? 
I do think it will still exist. I think that, um, so I'll kind of answer from your last question and then I'll, I'll yeah. go back. Um, I think that, that there's an important aspect to the appraiser and it's important for appraisers to recognize where they bring value. If you listen to, um, you know, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, Lyle Radke um, and Scott Reuter talk to appraisers, they talk a lot about where the appraiser brings value in the process and ensure that they're focusing in on doing that. You know, the appraiser may not be needed to do a cookie cutter home in a, you know, a very homogenous neighborhood in the future, because there's a lot of data and analytics that, that they have available for them to assess that risk. But as you get into other types of properties and different types of areas, there's a real importance to how the appraiser, um, you know, interacts with that and brings value and making sure they're using technologies, supporting their results, providing the right analyses, like around market analysis. I mean, we just went through this huge nationwide increase in values, right? If appraisers weren't providing adjustments for comparables for time, market adjustments, yeah. there's probably a problem there, right? Like everywhere in the country was increasing over the last two years. And now some areas are going down, some areas are still going up. And that appraiser brings that specialty and that expertise to be able to provide that analysis. And I will tell you, ABMs and computers are still far, far off uh, from understanding those sorts of aspects in an accurate and reliable fashion. And I think the appraiser will play a role for uh, the foreseeable future. But we need the appraisers to, um, you know, recognize that and focus and hone in their skills and ensure that they're performing their craft in, in the best way to, to drive credibility around our profession. And as you know, I, I am an appraiser. Um, we also have a data master product at class, which helps drive the analytics component of the process. And I think it really comes to adoption of tools. And so I'll come back to the, to the other part of your question. This is where the younger generations get more excited about our profession. I don't think they would be excited to take a, a tape measure and a clipboard um, and a digital camera out into the field and you know come back and do word processing on their computer when they got home to generate the appraisal. They want to be more excited through using cool tools and technologies and analytics and really um, you know more modern type of platform that they are making an impact in, in that way. So class is focused on that. And we have a staff appraiser program. We do bring trainees into our staff appraiser program to groom the future of the appraisal profession. We also work with, uh, you know, uh, initiatives like ADI with the GSEs on appraisal diversity and bringing in more diversity into our profession and ensuring that we're, you know, leading and bringing in the future appraisers um, into our profession to, to go forward. And, and I think that, times like this, times of change, times of innovation and modernization, they actually make a big impact on bringing younger talent into the profession because it becomes more exciting and something to participate in. So I'm listening to this and I feel like you're telling me that appraisals will become easier to do. Yeah, well, that's... I think it's going to be a combination of both. I think that they'll be supported. It'll be easier to drive a more credible report by using technology and analytics to do that. But I actually think the properties that fall into the appraiser's hands are going to get harder. So, you know, those ones we used to get where you're like, oh, cool, man, I got three model matches. Bing, bang, boom. You knock that thing out. Um, it's it, it less and less likely that those types of properties are going to continue to flow in at scale to the appraiser. So I think the appraiser is going to be challenged. And that's what I mean. They, they need to bring their expertise and be good at what they do to support that that's why they're there and that's what they're being valued for. And if you listen to what the investors are asking for, who ultimately are setting those policies and expectations to the appraisers, that's what they're saying right now. Yeah. What keeps you up at night in this industry? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, well, six months ago, it was the it was the market. Um, I think <laughs> we're starting to see a, a bottom. Um, it's been a it's been a tumultuous year and a half as rates went up so quickly. I think for all of us, right? You, me, everyone involved, we've all been through cycles before. But when you see the numbers of uh, you know how drastic of an impact those rates had in our environment in terms of the addressable market, that that was. Uh, 
one of the more challenging times that I think we've all navigated. Um, again, we've all been there, but that was a pretty severe drop in an addressable market. I mean, even greater potentially than the housing crisis of 2008. Um, now I would say it's really helping the market understand what's available to them. I think often we find that folks don't even know about some of these new programs and the value that they can bring, or they had an experience and a test and learn with another provider that gave them a bad taste in their mouth. So they don't want to try it again. We always thought the challenge was going to be mostly in building appraiser adoption around these new solutions. And, and we faced that back in 2018, 2019, 2020, when we were in test and learn and working with lenders that were more progressive. Now it's more about real estate agents, mortgage brokers, loan officers, you know, helping them understand that there's actually a lot of opportunity through this modernization to improve your experience. And so maybe if you've had a bad experience in the past with, with one of these solutions that didn't go well, recognizing not all solutions are created equal. It's really important that whoever's performing the services has advanced technologies to support it. You really can't do a good job without that. You can't send somebody else out in the field to collect property data that's other than an appraiser if you're not using um, advanced technologies to do so. Like our appraisers, for instance, when they get this data, we bring them into a virtual reality environment. I mean, they can literally walk through the home as if they were there physically on a virtual platform through, you know, what you would all experience with like a virtual tour on a listing when you can walk through that home. We have a full environment where we provide that to the appraiser to inspire confidence in them and to inspire confidence in real estate agents and others. The appraiser is actually seeing the whole home. They're getting a full comprehensive view versus some folks just provide like a 78 page PDF with two dimensional images in it and a bunch of textual information about that home. It's a lot harder for an appraiser to do an appraisal based off of a PDF than it is off of a virtual reality environment like that yeah. we provide here at class and, and the consistency and accuracy of that data collection. Um, you know, you still have to underwrite a data collection file like an appraisal, except it just doesn't have comps, but you have to ensure that that property meets the eligibility requirements for, you know, saleability to your investor. And that's another thing I think that's important to ensure that the technologies being utilized are, are, are gathering that, but mm -hmm. these are great products and, and a big opportunity for us to improve the experience. I mean, think about it, all the data is collected at point of list. And you can get either an immediate waiver because the data has already been collected in a data and waiver you know, scenario, or if you need an appraisal, you can get that back in 24 hours versus waiting three or four weeks because right. you don't have to send an appraiser out to the property. Um, you know, and so I, I think that, that uh, making sure the market knows and understands these products and that they're aware of them and they have the right perception. That's probably what keeps me awake right, right now at night is, is ensuring we're getting the right information out there and the accurate information. Um, because there's also a lot of our competitors who may be trying to also talk these solutions down because they can't provide them. And mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, there are people who are against change because they're scared of change because of the threat to the, to the market. But really there's a lot of value here and we, we want to ensure that our partners understand that value. Yeah, I love it that you're a company that embraces the change and you, you find your value with inside that change. If I'm a lender, if I'm a broker, what's what's something that I need to know about the GSC policy? Like, is there something that I really should be able to concentrate on um, that would be good for me to know? I think the two most important things that I hear coming up for questions around this that, that we're finding is one, how do you know that it's eligible eligible for these for these solutions? Sometimes right. the the way it will come up on on the platforms would be it, it might still say that a 1004 appraisal is required, but if you continue reading down through those eligibility um, messages, you'll see that it is eligible for value acceptance plus data. You know, if we're talking about Fannie Mae. Um, or looking on, on Freddie's uh, findings to say ACE plus PDR. If those are there, then that solution is eligible and you can move forward. With say that, that again on Freddie so that everybody caught that because, you know, getting everyone to read their true findings for what pay stubs you need, let alone the appraisal, is sometimes challenging. Um, I think it has, yeah, it has proven to be a bigger part of the challenges for folks to know and understand how to navigate that. Um, and again, I don't see those on a daily basis, but I hear from our partners what they're running into. Mm -hmm. And it's really looking to ensure, like with Freddie, looking for that ACE plus PDR option um, in the loan file. 
you know, and then on Fanny looking for value acceptance plus data. There's also options for desktop and, you know, desktop appraisals have kind of gotten a bad name. This is one of the things I was just talking about because you don't necessarily have to send someone out to collect data on the property for desktop. However, there are certain aspects of information needed in order to use it. And so what happened when it was rolled out is some folks who didn't understand these, they would send out a desktop to an appraisal, appraiser, mm -hmm. sorry. That appraiser would get it. They'd start looking for the information. They'd find out that they didn't have everything that was needed. And so then they'd send back and say, this has to be upgraded to a 1004. Well, you just lost day, potentially days of time. Or even worse, the appraiser went out and did it. They didn't understand the guidelines. They sent it in and then you found out in underwriting, it didn't have everything that was needed. And so now you're starting from scratch again after losing potentially a week of time. Right. And so at class, what we do is we actually proactively go out and collect that data for desktop with our data collector, make it look more like a hybrid process, which hybrids are not in policy yet, but we, we do expect at some point in the future, those most likely will come to policy. They're just in testing them today. Okay. But we use that process to support desktop. And with that, we did the 48 hour desktop program, you know, where we could get appraisals back in 48 hours on purchase transactions. It's a great nice. product if it's done right. But if it's done wrong, Chris, it's terrible, right? And so people <laughs> have tried it, had a bad experience and been like, oh, I'm not doing that again. Matt almost killed my deal, right? Because yeah. I had to wait weeks and then we had to go get a 1004 anyways and all these things. And so it's really important you're working with partners who understand those nuances and apply the right processes. And if you do it, you can actually get a great result. Um, and so, yeah, looking for those eligibilities, understanding desktop on purchase transactions and understanding the data and waiver programs with value acceptance plus data and ACE plus PDR, um, because those don't need an appraisal at all. Value acceptance plus data is a waiver with go out and collect some property data, you know, two to 300 bucks, whatever it is, you know, everybody's got a different price. Um, right. you get that back and you're, and you're good to move forward. The second part of that, and the same with ACE plus PDR is if you use those two data products, you do from an underwriting perspective, the most simple way to think of it is underwriting an appraisal that doesn't have comps. You just review the data the same way you would an appraisal to understand the subject property and does that property meet their eligibility? Is it in C5 or C6 condition? All the same things an underwriter would do when they look through an appraisal report around the subject. It's the exact same. And that's the process your underwriters need to follow. And a class with our property data advantage report is what we call it. It's totally fungible. So it meets the expectations for both Fannie and Freddie. So if you need to pivot back and forth, you could do that. If you went from ACE plus PDR to value acceptance plus data, it's one, one product. It also, by the way, would support if you needed to upgrade to a hybrid for some reason. And, and the only reason that typically happens is if something changes in the credit file. So okay. if you're initially eligible for one of these waiver plus data programs, you're good right. to go through. There's nothing around the property that's going to change that. It's more about if, if you make a change in the credit file. That DTI got higher, numbers. less asset, That's right. Whatever that's correct. Yep. What, so it's what about across, Jenny, across, though? Across the board. What about Jenny? I mean, we talked about Fannie and Freddie. What, what's Jenny's plan in all of this? I think there is, they, look, we've been talking um, to them for the last couple of years, I think like usual, they're monitoring everything, kind of waiting for this new path to be set. And then I think we will see adoption coming from, from other investors as we move forward. But typically, like, like normal, right? Typically, Fannie and Freddie kind of set the standard and then others are fast followers to that. Yeah. Anything weird or unique changing in the jumbo market? Huh, not, not really that I could think of, but I would imagine that, you know, they'll, as soon as these, products roll out into uh, um, more mainstream that they'll start to look at, at being able to, to leverage them as well. Yeah. I think when the market really stabilizes a little bit, we'll see more jumbo uh, options and opportunities in, in that market. And of course that's, you know, most of the jumbo opportunity is tied to that property value and the consistency of that property value. Uh, one, one thing, Chris, we've talked about in that, and we've, we've done some some pilots with this with, with Jumbo lenders, is when you do need dual appraisals because you've got a transaction that, that you know requires that uh, dual appraisal process, yeah. you could send out a data collector, right? You could get one single property data collection and both appraisers base their opinions off that data collection. And so oftentimes when we see discrepancies between two appraisals, right, it's because one appraiser measured it at 4,000 square feet less than the other appraiser. And so now you're dealing with two different GLAs and two different values and it causes all kinds of problems in the process. 
Um, and look, as an appraiser and as somebody who measuring properties was one of the hardest things to learn how to do. And we know that out of appraisal submitted to the UCDP, Fannie and Freddie's platform over the last 10 years, there's a huge discrepancy on the same property between different appraisers. And so what these technologies allow is for us to get to a standard way of collecting data and a repeatable way. Again, five different people go to the property, you get the same five results every single time because the technology is much more accurate at generating detailed floor plans, you know, um, much more small areas of, of margin of error in the measurements um, compared to a human going out there with a tape measure and, and maybe rounding to the, to the half foot, right? So um, these are the opportunities we can bring more consistency in, into products like that. So we're dealing with the same data on both appraisals. Yeah, I love it. This has been really, really informative. You know, as we close, um, Scott, what would be one or two things that uh, um, you want to make sure that everybody uh, got out of this uh, out of this podcast today? What's one or two th big takeaways that you want to make sure that we all understand? I would say re really look at the um, eligibility options. Try these data and waiver programs. I think you'll find a lot of value in them. And then pick your providers, you know, make sure that when you try them, you're using the right providers. And look, there's some competitors of ours that are out there that are using technologies and doing a good job with this as well. Um, but there's some that aren't. And so make sure you understand who you're working with and pick the right partner. And I think you'll have a really valued experience um, trying out these new solutions. So um, just be mindful of, of who you're selecting as your partners. Yeah, you know what? I think that is absolutely the truth. We we teach all the time. I, I said impact and creating impact. And I think that you and your company does a good job of, of teaching us, keeping us informed, staying involved in the industry, but then, you know, also giving us great feedback and comfort uh, to be able to know that you're going to deliver and get us this appraisal that we need to be able to facilitate that closing. But picking a partner, like we, at, we work with realtors all the time and builders, <coughs> And that's all about partnership. It's all about trust. It's all about being able to uh, work together and to be able to create this great client experience because without a referral, without our next deal, we're only as good as that last one. And I feel like class has done a really, really good job of being a great partner of ours, but also a great partner with uh, uh, tons of companies across the United States. And Scott, I gotta say, thank you so much for uh, coming on and, and uh, get me up to speed. I learned a couple of things. I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, me too, Chris. Yeah. And we appreciate your partnership and, and uh, thank you so much for, for those kind words. And um, you know, we all care a lot about class and believe in it. And uh, we got a great group of people over here working hard to try to, to, to work hard for you guys and, and bring uh, you the best solutions. Love it. Listen, if you enjoyed this, uh, make sure you comment, make sure you share. Also, if you know a friend that you think this would give value to, make sure you ask them uh, or invite them to join to this group. And lastly, if there's a topic or maybe you want me to bring somebody on that you think would add great value to everyone, please, please let me know. I want to be able to cater this to you. I feel like the more we know in the industry, the more we're informed, the better we are. And uh, working with great partners like Class is definitely going to make us all better. So again, Scott, thanks for coming on this call. And I hope everybody enjoyed this today. See ya. Thanks, Chris.